Okay, we're recording finally. We're going to do another live reaction. Yeah, we're full of piss and vinegar today, so <laughs> it's been one of those days. We've had a rough day. We we worked all day and then we came home and we were like, heard earlier that the governing body has a new update and we really should have. They're like, you should go watch this. We're like, all yeah, right. Yeah, the time to watch it because we don't really watch a lot of the stuff anymore. And so we're like, should we do another live reaction? Because it's kind of full of surprises. So. So we've heard. We've heard. Okay, are we ready to watch this? Yeah, you can make us bigger than that. I think probably as soon as you play, then you can. Hit play and then slide us, make us big and slide us around. Yeah. Make it Welcome big. to our update. Before. How did the 2023 annual meeting affect you? Remember the information that highlighted Jehovah as the merciful the judge of around. all the earth? We were thrilled to learn that individuals who died now in the flood of Noah's the day, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and even some who Santa. might repent during the Great Tribulation, <laughs> could benefit from Jehovah's mercy. Since hearing I'm that information, gifts. have you found Without yourself it. thinking a lot about Jehovah's mercy? Well, so has the governing body. In our mercy. prayerful study, mm. meditation, and discussions, we've focused our attention on how Jehovah candy. has dealt with people <laughs> who engaged in serious sin. In this update, we'll briefly consider the pattern Jehovah set in the Bible record. Then we'll discuss some new information regarding the way we'll handle cases of wrongdoing in the Christian congregation. Second Peter 3 verse 9 tells us that Jehovah does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but desires all to attain to repentance. What does that teach us? It helps us understand that Jehovah wants people to repent and gain life. Mm. When the first human couple rebelled, they condemned the human race to sin and death. Rebelled to who? What did Jehovah do? He took immediate steps to help as many of their descendants as possible to gain life. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, Jehovah arranged to cover the sins of all who would exercise faith and repent. Such ones can live forever. So it's not surprising that throughout the Bible record, we find Jehovah appealing to sinners to repent. He urges those who had strayed from true worship to return. This is in harmony with Romans 2 verse 4, which says, or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience because you do not know that God in his kindness is trying to lead you to repentance? Consider some examples in which we see Jehovah trying to lead sinners to repentance. Cain showed murderous hatred for his brother Abel, but Jehovah reached out to Cain and tried to reason with him. When David sinned, Jehovah used the prophet Nathan to lead David to repentance. And what about the nation of Israel? Jehovah kept appealing to them, even when they showed no desire to repent. At Ezekiel 33, 11, Jehovah appeals to the nation of Israel, as surely as I am alive, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that someone wicked changes his way and keeps living. Turn back, turn back from your bad ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? What does this teach us? That while Jehovah doesn't force anyone to repent of his sins, he has demonstrated great compassion for imperfect humans. He's gone to great lengths to make forgiveness possible, to appeal to sinners. Yeah, so you said, you can go ahead first, because you said, I you already see the spin. Well, it's like they want to play mediator. I guess they're just bringing out all these men. I don't understand what you're saying. Like, they, like using a certain individual to help lead someone back to repentance. And so I, I'm seeing the spin is, 
they're going to use the governing body or elders to lead those people back to repentance. Right. Except for the fact that every one of those verses that you bring out, when you're talking about the house of Israel, those were the ones that were wrong. And now they like spin it to make it like they are Ezekiel. When Ezekiel, as we talked about in the last video, everything was about how the house of Israel or God's organization was apostate, was doing things wrong, was doing, you know, so. Not the individual rogue person. That yeah, not the one rogue person that we see often. Jesus was rogue in his own. Uh, he was apostate from God's organization at the time, not from Jehovah, but from yeah. God's organization because of the abuses they had. Even though they had many truths, that, that doesn't matter. Look at Ezekiel's. Look at Ezekiel, though. Yeah, exactly. Look at Ezekiel's day. They had truths, but it didn't overshadow the wrongs and the abuses that they were doing. Yeah. And, and that's the, the point here is that they want to make it seem like, and it's true, no doubt in Ezekiel's day, there were those who were not um, doing right and who were persecuted, if you were will, or punished for doing things against Jehovah himself as well. But the problem is, is that they threw in those like Ezekiel, like um, Elijah, that were doing right by God, and they wanted to off him too, you know, so off those types of people too, same as Jesus Christ, they wanted to off him as well, and treat him just like the wrongdoers, just because they, he balked at their supposed authority, and this is the exact same thing that no matter what they do, we're going to see that that's what happens here, I can just about bet. And to lead them to repentance, if at all possible. What a compassionate and merciful God we worship. The governing body has prayerfully considered how Jehovah's mercy could be better reflected when dealing with wrongdoers in the congregation. So how about the wrongdoing that the governing body has done over the years, instead of just saying that Jehovah's done it, saying that Jesus did it because he was leading them. You know, so when are you going to own up to the wrongdoings that you've done? Oh, no, we, we never admit wrong. We don't. We have no need for apology, I think, is what, what one broadcast said. So it, it, it's, it's very hypocritical that they want everybody else to apologize or to be repentant, but they don't want to. And to push. They want to push humility when they themselves are not acting humble. Yeah, that's right. If they're in that position. I mean. And that's led to a clearer understanding of three scriptures. Let's consider the first. Or maybe it's because nobody's coming anymore and you're grasping at straws and you're doing everything you can to wipe away all the trivial things to make it seem like you're more reasonable. But really, probably the same policies are going to be there that caused the abuses in the first place. And it's, you know what, it's very... we. Dealing with things like eBay, dealing with companies like UPS, dealing with companies like it doesn't matter, it, it, whatever, the governments, all of it's the same. They all play this same game of the shell game of responsibility and try to blame shovel it on on you as the problem. Never mind that it's their policies. Never mind that it's the way they continue to manipulate through greed. Never mind that. Uh, it, it's the same thing. They try to try to make you feel like you're ap appeased. Try to pay play like they're your. All the wording is like a psycho psychologist, psych therapist, whatever you want to call it. Um, they use that soft speech wording. We're sorry you feel that way. You know. Sorry you're having to experience this. Yeah, I mean, just all those types of things, uh, without ever fixing the policies that cause the problems. The big problems. Yeah. yeah. It's 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25. There, Paul said, For a slave of the Lord does not need to fight, but needs to be gentle toward all, qualified to teach, showing restraint when wrong, instructing with mildness those not favorably disposed. Perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to an accurate knowledge of truth. And that's the other thing they do is they'll take a scripture like this. They'll button, push, button, push, button, push. And then when you knock over tables, then you're the wrong one. 
Then when you knock over tables like Jesus did and said, get out of the house of my father, you, you, you're a bunch of offspring of vipers, then you're the wrong one. And, th and they'll frame all this and they'll do it with a mild tongue because they're the one that has the power. And when you have the power, it's very easy to be the one with a mild tongue because in the end, you can off someone's head with just a mild tongue. I love that scripture where it says a mild, a mild tongue can break a bone. And I always thought of it in one way. It's, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's very strong and powerful. And then I thought about it the other way. And it's like, yeah, you can, if you've got the power, you can kill somebody with a mild tone. Mm -hmm. So it's funny when, when they try to twist things like this. Again, it's that manipulation and just pulling the other side of it. They're the ones with the power. So it's really easy to maintain control. But how do you think they're acting? They're throwing tizzy fits when it comes to their their uh, situation in Russia. So, anyway. I'm gonna watch the clock. To whom was Paul referring when he mentioned those not favorably disposed? A study note on 2 Timothy 2, 25 explains. Paul uses a Greek word that in this context refers to people who resist Christian teachings or who place themselves in opposition to them. Paul may have had in mind, among others, those in the congregation in Ephesus who had a negative attitude toward following scriptural counsel or heeding oh, admonition okay. from brothers taking the lead. Yeah, so again, now you can bring up anything. You know, they've, they've the shoes that I wore were not the right shoes one time. And if you didn't listen to their counsel, well, then you weren't heeding the admonition and you could be disfellowship for that. Literally, I had an elder talk about this and he's like, is this apostate thinking? Why? Because of my shoes? Why? Because I, I went to play foosball in a sports bar? Because Why? Because I, I'm not wearing the right color shirt? The admonition, these are documented real life cases that has gone on in the con the Christian congregation in Jehovah's Witnesses for a long time. All of these admonitions of anybody's opinion. No, it's because your Mustang is not stock enough. Yeah, right. That too. Today, this could include brothers and sisters in the congregation who disregard scriptural counsel and become involved in serious wrongdoing. So the, there's a huge difference between disregard biblical counsel and others, what you think. That's where the going beyond the things written comes in. So in other words, and, and we've gone over this over and over and over and over again in so many areas, it just becomes frustrating to even talk. It's like talking to a brick wall when you're, anyway, they go beyond the things written and they'll say, but Jesus, don't you see it's okay to wash up to your elbows? You know, that's scriptural counsel. It's based in the scriptures. You know, same same with, uh, you know, picking grain on the Sabbath. You know, that that's, that's you, you're not obeying the scriptural counsel. As they say, the devil's in the details. You are fired up today. Yeah, I told you I was full of piss and vinegar. You kind of are. Someone who gets involved in serious wrongdoing needs help from the elders. So, uh, so we kick them out of the congregation. I can't even get through a sentence. I mean, yeah, you can't even get through a sentence. It's just crazy. So <laughs> it's it's funny that, and I agree, the wrongdoing, you, you do back. need to have some help, helping someone and understanding their circumstance. Is that what the experience has been with those among Jehovah's Witnesses? Is, is that what happens when you go to the elders? A committee of elders meets with the wrongdoer. The goal of these elders isn't merely to judge whether the wrongdoer is repentant, but also to act in harmony with 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. Everybody knows that when you go into a judicial committee, you're done. Nobody goes into a judicial committee and goes, the elders helped me out very much. And, and it, it, you're pretty much done. And you're just, Guilty. you know, nine ten times out of 10, Guilty. 99 Guilty. times out of 100. You know, a, a judicial committee comes back with a disfellowshipping. That's what they're, yeah. Guilty until proven innocent. Yeah, that's right. The elders must correct and instruct the wrongdoer with mildness. What is their goal? 
to hold Notice a grudge. Notice what another study note on 2 Timothy 2.25 says. When a Christian elder mildly corrects or instructs those not favorably disposed, the good result may be repentance or a change of mind. The credit for such a change in thinking and attitude goes not to any human, but to Jehovah, who helps the wayward Christian make this vital change. Paul goes on to mention some of the beautiful results of such repentance. It leads the sinner to a more accurate knowledge of the truth. It helps him come back to his proper senses, and it enables him to escape from Satan's snares. This was brought up over and over again by one elder, and he, and he said, well, we're, we're trying to snatch you out of the fire. What, what, what is exactly are you trying to snatch me out of the fire from? So, so for example, um, if I'm going to do wrong, let's say I'm sleeping around, and an elder comes and he says, uh, or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think of something on those lines, whether you're single or whether I'm mar you're married, and out doing something like that. And you say, what, what's the possible fire that's going to come to me? That should be a pretty easy answer. Well, think of the harm you're going to do to your, to your marriage. Think about the, and if you're not married, think about the potential, and even if you are, think about the potential uh, uh, possibilities of sleeping around. There's sexually transmitted diseases. That, that wouldn't be good for you. Or how about uh, uh, unwanted pregnancies? How, how, that wouldn't be good for you. Um, even the emotional uh, struggles that you may have. Is that going to work out? So, I mean, you can easily name the things that are the fire that you'll get burned from. In the case that we were going through, what are you trying to snatch me out of the fire from? I'm trying to get you guys, in our case it was, to come forward with why you're abusing us. Why is it you removed all of our privileges for no reason whatsoever? Why is it that you can't ask the question of, a Bible study of Tiffany's when she asks, so you don't want me to use my Pope for the answers, but now I have to use these eight, eight Popes. Well, now it's, is it back to eight now? No, nine? nine or 10. So of the governing body, Pope, Papa, which one's your father? Well, I thought we only had one father. Jesus said, you are brothers. Anyway, so it, Again, with wrongdoing, it should be pretty easy to say what snares I'm snatching you out of. So when he says this is Bible-based counsel and they say, oh, your shoes, I don't like your shoes. What's the fire? What's Satan's snare on which shoes you're going to wear? What was Satan's snare with the beards? So the elders have the goal of leading the wrongdoer to repentance. How does a clearer understanding of 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 adjust our current arrangement? Presently, a committee of elders normally meets with a wrongdoer only one time. However, the governing body has decided that the committee may decide to meet with the person more than once. Why? May decide. At Revelation 2, 21, regarding that... Hold on. May decide. It, that's just like when they said about beards, well, some congregations, all this does is cause that, we talked about Hitler before in, in uh, World War II and how on one side he would make one argument to one group of people and then he'd make an argument to the next group of people and when they'd get to bickering them, among themselves, then they'd look to him as the authority figure to straighten it all out. That's the same thing they're doing here. They give these soft ideas and then they'll be bickering and then they'll have to clarify it later on again, elevating themselves in everybody's eyes. But it was the same thing with beards. You know, some congregations, some areas where it's acceptable, and you go and you tell the elders that in your, in your hall, in your specific hall, and then they'll say, oh, well, that's not here. So it's going to be the same thing. Well, sometimes we can use a two. Well, that's not here. Or this isn't that case. That woman Jezebel, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. We hope that through the loving efforts of the elders, Jehovah will help a wayward Christian to come back to his proper senses and repent. If he repents, 
the committee will provide shepherding so that the person can escape from Satan's snares and keep making straight paths for his feet. I have something to say. You want go to ahead. Talk? No, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just meditating on this, like more than one meeting. And it's like, you know, even when they do like an admonition, they want to give you two admonitions. Correct. But it becomes a check in a box. But that's what I'm saying is like, I mean, I think about the, I don't even know how many meetings we had with the elders. Half of them we called. Most of them we called. Right. We initiated, like we were trying to solve this problem. And anyway, we'll get to that. But that's what I'm wondering is like, when will they call these meetings? Like, are, is it going to be the same three elders? You know what I mean? Like, It'd be great if it was under it because everything is put forth like this, like it's a spirit of love. That ain't what it happens. Ain't. That ain't what happens. No way. I remember sitting down there with in one of our meetings and going, is this an admonition? Have we received an admonition? Will you tell us if this is an admonition? And using that key word, and it was just a straight good old Jim, our, our ski elder was just like a blank straight face. Wouldn't even answer, wouldn't even reply. And that that's the kind of cold, pharisaic attitude you get. Not some loving uh, effort to correct something. But even when you asked him, I don't know if it was the same meeting, but even when you asked him, um, is this a, a witch hunt? No, you said, is this a head hunt? Are you head hunting us? Head hunting us. Most assuredly, I'll tell you we're not, or something like Which that. Very monotone. And it was no like, and I think that was the next time that he called me and told us we were having a disfellowship. Whatever. <laughs> it's judicial. We need to meet with you. It's judicial. Oh, you're not headhunting us, huh? This arrangement reflects the same effort that Jehovah personally made to help David and the nation of Israel to repent. What about baptized minors, those under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? Oh, this has got to be good. Meddling in what's not. This favors. has got to be good. This is whatever is going to come after this. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. This has been by government and authorities that they're, because they've always, they've hung to this idea of, it's a little bit different inside the family. You know, you keep maintain family arrangements. Guaranteed, this has something to do, especially in Europe, where they're upset with them and taking away their religious status because of, of abuse towards children. Anyway. Under our current arrangement, such a baptized minor, along with his Christian parents, must meet with a committee of elders. Under our new arrangement, Two elders will meet with the minor and his Christian parents. Two, that the means elders no... will find out what steps the parents have already. So that means if it's only two, it's not judicial. Yeah. Ready taken to help their child come to repentance. If the minor has a good attitude and the parents are reaching him, the two elders might decide that it isn't necessary to take the matter any further. Of course, the elders will occasionally check with the parents to make sure that the minor is getting the help he needs. Oh, However, this is what if a baptized minor unrepentantly persists in a wrong course? In that case, a committee of elders would meet with him along with his Christian parents. The governing body is confident. That really doesn't seem like it's much of a change at all. Because they meet with the parents and them anyway. Not always. Yeah, but it, it goes. It's the same thing about the admonition thing. Unless they're just creating another checks and box step in there. I, I I don't know, but I mean, I'm trying to think back. Granted, I don't have any situation like that as a minor, and I'm trying to think of people that I know that were minors. But it's sort of like if you've done something so awful. It's not against your parents. It's against Jehovah. So you've got to go on your own into the elders meeting. I mean, even when you're, I don't know, you've heard some of these stories of even children who have been abused and they have to go and sit in the meeting with elders by themselves or a, a young girl. Has children? To, yes. A young girl, a minor oh, has to I talk see. about their sexual sin That's... to these men. That's mm -hmm. disgusting. It's well, he business. said that now. So apparently they've changed that. Well, that's what he's saying, yeah. Well, no, he said previously, they've. Uh, I believe if we just went okay. back, they said okay. that right now, 
it goes straight to. So if I'm understanding it correctly, I think you're, there might've been a time what you're talking about is correct too, mm -hmm. but they, they make it, maybe they made a revision to that, to where you have to go to, you have to have your parents with you. And then now they're saying there's going to be one more step in there where before you even, because before, let's say you're caught smoking, they just pull you in previously under what you're talking about. They would just pull that youth in and talk to them and have a judicial committee. And now they're having the parents more and, involved. And before, and then it became to where, so that's before, and then they had it where now you've got caught smoking. We have you and your parents come in and now it's, um, you've been caught smoking. We're going to go send two to your parents with the minor. And then if it doesn't get corrected, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it in. So there's, it seems like they're adding one step there. Possibly. That these adjustments reflect Jehovah's desire to lead sinners to repentance. He wants them to come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. He does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but he desires all to attain to repentance. Let's move on to our second scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 5, 13, which says, Remove the wicked person from among yourselves. The Bible clearly teaches that an unrepentant wrongdoer should be removed from the congregation. And really, it's a consequence that the wrongdoer has chosen. Why so? Because he refuses to respond to repeated loving attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. Even when the elders inform a person that he's being removed from the congregation, he won't be left hopeless. The committee will not simply explain what steps he can take to be welcomed back into the congregation. What else will they do? The elders will explain that they'd like to meet with the individual again after a few months to see if he's had a change of heart. Months. How, how many years has it been? Months. How, how many years has it been now? Five five years since we've been disfellowshipped. I haven't. I, heard. I haven't heard anything. Hide your hair from them. I haven't heard a, a phone call. Give your life pioneering for these people, but for. A decade? Maybe, maybe I wasn't listening. Was this from the first time they have a meeting and then they're going to try to bring the one back to repentance? They haven't announced it, but they're going to try to just let some time go by. Is the, Are they just stretching out the reproof? Well, did he? No, because he said a few months, right? Let's go back. Else will they do? The elder from the congregation, he won't be left hopeless. On to repeated loving attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. Even when the elders inform a person that he's being removed from the congregation, That's he fellowship. won't be left hopeless. Okay. The committee will not simply explain what steps he can take to be welcomed back into the congregation. What else will they do? The elders will explain that they'd like to meet with the individual again after a few months to see if he's had a change of heart. If the individual is willing to meet, the elders will make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. What about individuals who were disfellowshipped in the past, perhaps even many years ago? In some cases, they may not even recall the reason they were disfellowshipped. They may have abandoned their wrong course years ago. Or maybe they never had a wrong course in the first place. What happens when the wrong was you guys? What about all those people that were right. abused? That's right. What about what about them? Or they stuck to the truth and then you changed your teaching and policy. Maybe they were disfellowship for having a beer. What what or blood situation or I mean, there's a number of things. Maybe, yeah, maybe they, they, you know, had a, a, what do you call that when you, an organ transplant, when it was, you know, thought to be cannibalism. Yeah. And then you allowed it, but you disfellowshipped them anyway. Are they, were they allowed? What then? Oh my gosh. Are you guys going to repent? We're Somebody sorry we did that to you? 
that the elders should visit such ones, pray with them, and make them. Pray with they them. They may have abandoned their role. Whoa, it? hold on a second. Pray with them. That's a whole new ball game in itself. What about individuals who were disfellowshipped in the past, perhaps even many years ago? In some cases, they may not even recall the reason they were disfellowshipped. They may have abandoned their wrong course years ago. The governing body has decided that the elders should visit such ones, pray with them, and make a warm appeal for them to return to the congregation. Geez, I wonder if I should give them a call back. Hey, I'm wondering when my visit's coming. They're not, they're not going I to. Wonder, I, I'm wondering when my visit's coming. They, they won't. When's my phone call? They, they won't. <laughs> There's got to be some caveat in here. <laughs> If a person's been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. <laughs> Therefore, if so... That's judgmental. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and by and large, sometimes you've done so much damage to people. It's it's like those in uh, Israel. I'm often reminded that to me, it's always like well, the 10 tribe kingdom split. Going off on a tangent, I know. The ten tribe kingdom split. And when they went and said, we're no longer going to slave for you anymore, stop doing this oppression. Stop oppressing us like this. And I don't remember who it was, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, one of the two, I was getting mixed up. He said, no, where my father's hand was heavy, I'm going to make it heavier. And they basically said, see you then, we're going to go off on our own. And they said, to your gods, O Israel. And so the oppression of God's organization at that time caused individuals to follow their own gods or whatever they wanted, you know, so to speak. And when it was an opposed to God, sometimes that happens. And that's sad. Who's the one who started that? It was the oppression of God's organization in those days. And along with it came the setting up of the high places where we lead to the questioning that was happening with the woman at the well in John 4. So it, it, it started with God's organization's oppression. So I, I won't deny that that sometimes or a lot, a lot of times is the case. Not always the case, though. Such a person is willing. The elders could arrange for him to have a Bible study even before he's reinstated. Of course, the individual would have to want to return to the congregation, and the elders would always be the ones to arrange for such a study. In imitation of Jehovah's mercy toward imperfect sinners, we want to reach out and help as many as possible to know that the door is open for them to come back to the congregation. You guys bleeding or what? I, I, I mean, you're needing your own transfusion. Now you're going to, now this is cell salvage is what this is. <laughs> this is cell salvage. We, we can't get any blood from anywhere else because nobody's coming in. And we've knocked out a whole lot of the ones uh, who were in. And now we're bleeding so bad that we need to try and soft pedal a bunch of stuff and, and do some cell salvage on the bleeding. That's That's what this is. Sorry, you wanted to say something. But... I'm just, yeah, I'm just meditating on that because it's like, why are they, why are they being so, like, just leave people alone. Let them live their lives. Instead, you're going to go around and you're going to try to harangue people into coming back and damage them more. Maybe they give that gold ring that's on his finger. and, and uh... If you are a disfellowship person listening to this. Quit worrying about everybody else's money. We right. urge you to accept the efforts of the elders to help you return to the congregation. All right. Odds of an elder contacting us. This should be a, a, a pretty humorous. Goose egg. Yeah. <laughs> I I just don't see it happening. I don't either. I've seen Not I've that. seen up here so many people fall through the cracks through elder irresponsibility and there's no checks and boxes. They wouldn't come here. They won't even try. They won't even try. It, but the funny thing is, here it is. We don't celebrate Christmas. We don't celebrate any of the holidays. 
we still believe Jehovah is God. We still believe in his son, Christ Jesus. Um, that there's not a difference in the core teachings, if you will, of witnesses. The, I, I don't know of any. Not in the core. Unless they want to claim 1914, which is... Yeah, that's not... That was never an issue for us in the first place as far as, eh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, in other words, we were so, you know, stiff on it. It's the way for them to uphold their authority. In, in any case, all of those types of things, we're probably just as close to Jehovah's Witness beliefs. And and we we probably won't even get a call. But I think yes, we'll see. I think we're more realistic of people, though. We're not fake people. And I think that's what makes us a little bit different, too. We, we just won't buy whatever they're trying to sell us, I think, is the other thing. But no, they won't come here. I think one of the reasons why they won't call us, not only are we labeled as an apostate, but they won't call us because they know that they were so wrong. Yeah, that's how, how would they mm -hmm. how what I think about that conversation and how the heck would that even go? Yep, exactly. Like I said, so what are you what are you here to apologize for? Because I'm still I still have a question that you didn't answer. And the question oh. is from a Bible study that's now dead and gone. And the question Poor is. Girl. What's that? Poor girl. Yeah. Uh, the question is. You say you don't have to follow that pope. But now we have to follow these eight popes. We better play this or we're going to lose. If you're living in an area where you don't know the local elders, please feel free to call or visit the local kingdom hall and request spiritual assistance. You're not going to have tabs on me. And, and that's the and that's the problem is, is that everyone out there is spiritually weak except you. And that's what you think. That's what you think is that yeah. you, nobody can be doing well without you. And it was the same thing. You need to leave the Christian congregation and get right with Jehovah, right? That was the statement. And in the, out of the same mouth, you can't have Jehovah without the Christian congregation. Which is it, Jim? You can't have it both ways, buddy. You can't say you need to get out of the congregation and get right with Jehovah and say, in other words, learn that we can, as our, as our circuit overseer said, um, you need to be humbled. Maybe, but not to you. What is the video? Not to you. Humbled to who? Jesus Christ did not need to be humbled to the Pharisees. Is it that Orwellian attitude about the authority? Yeah, 1984. You, we don't really care about the wrongdoing you committed. We just care that you recognize that we're your authority. Correct. 1984. Uh, uh, yep, that's the Orwellian line of thought. Jehovah wants you to come home, and we do too. Oh, I don't keep, well, well, where's home? Because Jesus said, Ooh, "Let's talk about this." What did what did Jesus say again? What did what did he say that you needed to go to when we think about that scripture about who who do you need to who? turn to? Oh, who? it's who? Uh, not where. Who? Oh, it wasn't where. Who? Oh. So it wasn't like them. That's not that to there. Oh. oh, I thought it was Jesus that is our home, so to speak. Being with the scriptural admonition at First Corinthians five eleven, when a person has been removed from the congregation, we stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. That means we don't socialize with those who are removed from the congregation. However, that does not mean that a Christian could not invite a disfellowship person to attend a congregation meeting. That disfellowship person could be a relative, Where's the a former at? Bible student, or someone we were close to in the past. How appropriate this adjustment is at this time, as we're preparing for the most important meeting of the year, the memorial, the which will be held padding. on Sunday, March 24th. What if a disfellowship person comes to a congregation meeting? Let me ask you this. Can you do memorial by yourself? Can you do memorial without having Papa in the way? Without a Pope? Absolutely you can. 
Absolutely can. We even have accounts and watchtowers of brothers that have done it from prison, um, that were did it when they were secluded areas. Um, yeah. So I, I believe it's more of a um, personal occasion anyway. Right. And they want to play mediator, though. That's what it is. They want to count their numbers like most corporate whatever's do. Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. Do we need a moving school back? However, okay. the governing body has decided that publishers can the use their Bible-trained conscience no. to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowshipped individual who attends a congregation. What? Bible-trained conscience? Hi. So good to see you here. Thank you. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, now we're micromanaging. we That's do awkward. not need to ignore him completely. We're so glad to see you're here. I, I can just see all the canned, the canned love bombing yep. and then cold shouldering. Yeah. It's so nice to see you. Was that too long? I, did I talk too long? Did I talk too long to them? I, I, <laughs> the elder so-and-so was literally looking at me funny. That brings us to our third scripture. It's Second John the emblem 9 here, to 11. The flag. There we read. Everyone who pushes ahead and does not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. It's over and over again. The one who does remain in this teaching is the one who has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him. For the one who says a greeting to him is a sharer in his wicked works. So it's up to your Christian Bible trained conscience, wink, wink, to say a greeting to them. But it doesn't mean that you won't be scrutinized by the elders because you're saying a greeting to them. It, Do you think that anybody in the congregation would come out here for memorial junk? Like in I have not seen a witness in the five years we've been disfellowshipped we out here doing preaching work. In our county. Yeah, in our county. And any of, you know, in the, granted, we don't spend a, a, a lot of time in neighboring counties, but I mean. And, you know, to be fair, in that five years, there was a pandemic. Yeah, that's So people true. weren't really doing a lot of movement anyway, but even in the last year or two. I've not seen hide or hair. Anyway. Well, let's just say this. How much, how often did they get out here to work the unassigned territory even before the pandemic? And I'm right. talking just work the territory unassigned. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we know so many individuals who elders, I don't know, e either incompetence or just drop the ball on. I'm talking funerals. I'm talking uh, a sister okay. fell down and died in her house. The mailman uh, found her. Come on, let's just not talk about her. I mean, but those are the types of things that happen to the nth degree, and they don't even keep tabs on, yeah, active brothers and sisters, much less disfellowshipped ones. But doesn't Second John nine to eleven tell us not to say a greeting to anyone who's been removed from the congregation? In examining the context of those verses, the governing body has concluded that the Apostle John was really describing apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. For good reason, John strongly directed Christians not even to greet such a person because of his contaminating influence. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual is a known apostate, or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, the elders would not visit him. So what's the definition of apostate? Because in the context of apostate means to push a wrong teaching. But the problem is they start lumping in anything apostate as speaking against what they have done. And so if you talk about the child abuse situation, then you're apostate. So it, it starts to lump these, and I agree with that statement, except for I don't believe it's the some authority that gets to tell you that. 
but it's more like the corrupting influence as we all hear about the illustration of the sponge and, and dirty water, if you uh, are a sponge and you get stuck in dirty water, you're not just going to absorb the clean water. You're going to get some of the mud on you. Uh, as 1 Corinthians uh, 15, says, bad association spoils useful habits. So I may choose not to associate with someone, just as the Apostle Paul said. He said this rebuke given by the majority was sufficient. In other words, there were some, albeit misguided, chose to have association with this individual. They probably didn't fare all that well from that association, but that was their decision. It was their Christian conscience. So I, I agree with that. It's all up to the Christian conscience, though, not set by some Pharisaic authority who's going to expel you from the congregation as the Pharisees would by a tribunal like the Paul said he was that Paul said he wasn't afraid of tribunal being three men so it, it's they've got they've got an absolute carbon copy of the Pharisaic system and, and the way it's was utilized and and they've they've proven true to follow that pattern it would be great if, they, if they'd change it to make it just be up to your Christian conscience. That's not what's happening here. I agree with that statement, but that's not what's happening here. Let me go back just a little bit. Even to greet such a person because of his contaminating influence. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual is a known apostate or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, the elders would not visit him. Ne so that's that's the point is that they can throw anybody they want into that into that uh and that would that would make sense if you have somebody that you're holding a grudge against yep yeah just put him in that just in and that. that's exactly what her uncle said who's an elder yeah who is the po co whatever you want to call it coordinator uh he said sounds like somebody's holding a grudge against you guys dang right it was and it started with the circuit overseer he flat out told us you need to be humbled. And that's because he got humbled over and over again because of his inaccurate, unscriptural statements. Neither would individual Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. Yeah, we won't get a call. In this up, because they'll throw whoever they we want. We examine that Jehovah's Love. desire to lead sinners to repentance. And we received clarification on three scriptures that relate to how wrongdoers should be dealt with. In harmony with 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, a committee of elders will lovingly correct and instruct a wrongdoer with the goal of leading him to repentance. And this just didn't happen to us either, where the elders wronged us, somebody in the congregation, and then just strung it out and wouldn't address them and wouldn't address what they did was wrong. I can go back to the individual in our, uh, another couple in our congregation that had situation with the elders and they absolutely handled it wrong. Absolutely handled it wrong. I mean, to the point of housing the man's wife in his basement when she's on prescription medications. The police knew about the situation. But the elders didn't really know how to handle the situation. They should have said, if there's an issue with there, then you'll need to call the police. Because he was doing the, the husband was doing the best he could in that situation to deal with that situation. And, and the elders get involved, hide the man's wife in their basement, away from him. I, the, 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 I, the things that went wrong, that's just scratching the surface. In any case, him coming back, I would go visit him. And the statements that I would get, oh, he's hostile. Because you guys did wrong to him? I would imagine so. I'd imagine he's a little upset. Another elder said to me, oh, well, he knows what he needs to do. He needs to do? What about you? What about you guys and what you did? They just never admit any fault. As outlined at 1 Corinthians 5.13, a person who refuses to repent must be removed from the congregation. 
However, the committee will still try to help him see the need to repent and return and will arrange for a follow-up meeting in a few months. It reminds me of the video we've got of that guy that was out in rugby. I repented. Well, or, yeah, on that side out in Botnell. Oh, I repented. What did you repent from? Oh, I just repented. You're not repentant. You don't have anything to repent from. They did you wrong. You were upset about it. We also clarified our understanding of 2 John 9 to 11, which we learned applies specifically to apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct, not to all those who have been removed from the congregation. That's all one and the same. An apostate is one who holds to wrong conduct and promotes wrong conduct. That's what an apostate is. by the scriptural definition. Otherwise, you just throw Jesus as an apostate because he turned away from the authorities. You throw the individual you talked about earlier, Ezekiel, as an apostate against Israel. And in fact, he was called that by Pasher. No, excuse me, that was uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. There's another one, though. You can't throw a dart at the Bible and not hit a prophet who's gone apostate. apostate from God's organization, because they were talking about the wrongs, they turned against them for the wrongs that they were committing. Ever since the first human couple sinned, Jehovah has been working to rescue repentant humans. Of course, Jehovah isn't permissive, and he doesn't shield unrepentant wrongdoers from the consequences of their actions. And that's fine. The consequences of their actions. It, 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 it goes back to the, it's the same thing. It, when they wanted to, they never actually called me Cora, you know, or used the perfect, but they would refer to it. Oh, you want, and I would say, okay, well, let's do Cora. Let's talk about that. You know what, how righteous Moses was? My, righteous Moses, he said, if it comes by my hand, then you know it wasn't from God. If your punishment or your discipline or whatever happens to you comes by my hand, you'll know it wasn't from God. However, if it comes from the lightning, the earth swallows you up, whatever, then you know it was from Jehovah. Funny thing is, is that that's what happened to Korah. So, you can't put yourself in the seat of Moses, as Jesus said. You place yourself in the seat of Moses. You can't place yourself in the seat of Moses and then not do what Moses did, not do the righteous works that Moses did. So if you're going to say that we did something wrong, and everybody's probably taking this things personally, I know we do when we look at these, we look at it through the reflection of ourselves. If you did some do something wrong, maybe you have something to do to be repentant for. For us, it's like, if it's just because we've turned apostate like Jesus did from God's organization or Elijah or Elisha or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, all of them went apostate from God's organization. If it's just because of that, anyway. Still, in his love, Jehovah wants sinners to become reconciled to him, if at all possible. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, so he appeals to them to repent. Elders are privileged to be fellow workers with Jehovah as they work to help sinners come to repentance. Our love for Jehovah continues to deepen as we meditate on his love, mercy, and compassion. We know you'll be happy to hear that the information contained in this update will be published in a series of articles that will appear in the study edition of the Watchtower. So we can micromanage it more, and no doubt there'll be an elder's book update too. <laughs> in addition, the elders will receive direction on how to apply this information. May Jehovah bless us. And no doubt 
that what happens in that application, as with all corporate, the the back office, as they call it in, in the corporate world, has different instructions on how they actually deal it versus how they portray it. <laughs> and the legalities that are behind it. That's right. That's right. And though they may not even discuss the legalities with them, but they'll say that this is the policy now. Us as we work to implement these arrangements that reflect his love and mercy. Before we conclude, the governing body has asked me to read the following announcement. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. What? <laughs> they just... They just Let's just throw that in there. Yeah, we'll just drop that at the bomb at the end. What is that? What is that? This is turning into SNL. <laughs> SNL. Oh, my goodness. So now Hillary Clinton's pants suit her in. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Where did this come from? We're just talking about... I, I... It's not enough that we're going to get try to drag the disfellowship people out. We're also going to let them wear their pants suits. <laughs> Well, I'm just, I'm really meditating on this because it's like beards. This is another way to micromanage. Did you ask if the sisters could wear beards last time? Okay, not, no, not sisters should've... wearing beards. I'm just saying like. I know, but the, I'm just, they can wear the pants of the family now. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm meditating on this micromanagement too, because I mean, immediately I was like, skirts hide things. I'll say skirts hide things. <laughs> Pantsuits up here or i'll just say pants up here i always wore pretty thick thermal leggings <laughs> under my skirts out in service and to the meetings because we live in north dakota and you'd freeze to death up here so i always wore that but it's like um pants show <laughs> curves and this is going to be another tight pant <laughs> micromanagement yeah, absolutely Tight pants, tight pants, leggings, leggings. <laughs> oh, a sister man. chooses to wear slacks on such occasions. They should not be casual, but dignified, modest, and appropriate. When a sister has a part on the program, she should wear a skirt or a dress, if that is the standard of dress in that land. If it is. Of and again, there it is. If it, if it is, and nothing else will matter anywhere else because that's what your elders are going to go with. <laughs> I'm so confused. Of course, some sisters may choose to wear a skirt or a dress even when they do not have a part on the program. In addition, oh, thank you. brothers may choose not to wear a tie or a jacket when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. If a brother chooses not to wear a tie or a jacket on such occasions, he should dress. Quick, sell all our tie stocks. Quick, dump them. <laughs> dump them. Garage sales full of skirts for everyone. <laughs> and ties and jackets. Yeah. I, I'm losing my mind. Okay, we got we to finish this because we haven't gotten to the guys on stage yet. In a manner that is appropriate, modest, and dignified, not casual. When a brother has a part on the program, he should wear a tie and a jacket if that is the standard of dress in that land. Do they have to match? <laughs> well, you, that means that if you're sitting in there, you better have your clip on ready in the back in case you got to do an impromptu. <laughs> no step-ins without having the, the clip on at the ready. Ah. <laughs> uh. Of course, some brothers may choose to wear a tie or a jacket, even when they do not have a part on the program. Those who are super spiritual will, because then the elders know that they can call on you to get on and do fill-in parts. So when you want to move up the ladder fast, make sure you still wear your, wear your tie and jacket. When visiting Bethel, it would be appropriate for brothers to wear a tie and a jacket, and for sisters to wear a skirt or a dress, if that is the standard of dress in that land. We love you all very much.
from the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is JW Broadcasting. Okay. I have Wowzers. something to say about this, too, because... Make this big. Okay. Um, I'm not smart Let's enough. just do stop share. Okay, now we're big again. So I, I just want to say about the, you know, reaching out to disfellowship people. It takes me a while to meditate on something. I'm not a quick reactor. I've got to really think about it. And, you know, if they did knock on our door or if somebody did show up. Not going to happen. But I'm just, <laughs> let's let's just entertain that thought. Okay. Just, uh, just for entertainment purposes. I don't know. Exactly. Um, why? This is just my knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to go home to... Because he talks about family in there before, right? Yep. Why would I want to go back home to abusive family members? Why would I put myself in that position to be around and socialize and do all the things with people where I've actually seen their true colors? I've actually seen how they really are and how abusive they are, how fake they are whatever the, the manipulation and the ways that they've done that manipulation yeah okay sorry why would i why would i even stoop to the to that i feel like i would be breaking the integrity that i have kept in my real life of not going back to abusive family members it's not like i'm going back and knocking on my parents door or not going i'm not i just i'm not doing that and, so and I why would, would I do that with them? And I want to say with the caveat of an apology, and I know that you yeah. you're you you handle that a little different to me than I do in a lot of cases. I'm like, she'll say, I'm never gonna do blah 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 again. And I'm I'm like, I don't say that. And I I said you shouldn't say that. I always give her that counsel. At least that's a counsel I apply to myself. I don't say that. I say, how's it gonna be any different? The result what's the, is the same. I what's guess. the apology and how's it gonna be any different? So in other words, if you call me, like you said, so let's play that out. What would we what would we say? Well, first, how about answering that question? Do we have to live through these eight popes now? Because that's the question our Bible study had that got us disfellowshipped. But that's the whole point. If you if you had even a little conversation like that, they'd be like, see, you're not repentant. That's right. That's no. right. Absolutely. And re the reality is, is they're not repentant. And that goes back to your question. Then, then why would I? even consider coming back to something you're the same all you've done you're is the same. all you've done is, is bring out you know, all you've done is you're an abuser who's brought out roses you're an abuser who's brought out roses didn't say you were sorry and just said we love you very much yeah yeah I, love. it just gives me the ick honestly the idea of it all it's like I don't know. Maybe I maybe the comparison is wrong, but it's sort of like, you know, how some religions will like baptize dead people because they're like trying to get their numbers up or right. certain government things. If you know, you know, you know, it's like you get these voters and they're dead. I mean, uh. what are you trying to do? Honestly, people will like he said in the video, some of these people are disfellowship. They may not even know why they're disfellowshipped or maybe the circumstances of their disfellowshipping is so convoluted. Manipulate, yeah, that's a good word. And manipulated. So like, I know of a story or I know of a situation of somebody who just faded and left, but yet there was a, a, a an elder that turned in a disassociation letter. So it's like the semantics of that story. It just, in other words, they didn't turn in a disassociation <laughs> letter. The elders apparently turned one in for them. <laughs> but that's what I mean. It's like all the manipulation and the the weirdness that goes on behind the scenes. You may not even know some of those things that went on behind the scenes, you know? So it's like, why? Those elders may be back? dead. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point too. Yeah. You how know, so you how are they going to call on them and whatever? And, and yeah, it's, it's so funny that there's so many different circumstances and things that you could think of. And like I said, I, I know at least in our area, the amount of ineptitude 
personally, I view it as negligence in bearing out their responsibilities other than the checks and boxes that the CEO actually checks specifically. They were more concerned about that stuff than love. Always, always more concerned about that. And I go back to the same, I'm sure I've told this story before. Uh, brother breaks his hip in the parking lot. Um, so in, at the Kingdom Hall. So we're like, we should really get together. And we go to the one, we go to Jim, our ski elder and say, uh, hey, uh, you know, we should go and, you know, make meals for that family. We're here every Tuesday and Sunday at least. So we, we're, we're up for doing it those days, but I think it should come through the elder body, you know, respecting the position. And he said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll get to it. Nothing happens. Next meeting, I come to him. Hey, Jim, do you have the, uh, you know, schedule filled in or people that are going to do this, these get these meals together for this family because they're having such hard times? Yeah, I'll get, I'll get right on that. Sorry about that. I, you know, nothing. Next meeting. I, I swear to God, this went on for at least two months. Ah, a month. Maybe probably a month. Yeah, probably about a month. month. Yep. Anyway, I want to over-exaggerate. No, you don't. But the, but the thing that ticked me off is, so then he comes to me and he says, uh, hey, we've got the Pioneer School is going to be happening at our hall. Wasn't that what it was? No, he said, I was wondering if you could get a meal together. And we and you were thinking, oh, it's for this family. Yeah, 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 we'll do that. Yep. And then he then his next statement was, it's for the Pioneer um, School this next coming week. And we're like. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? You're so wrong. Yeah. You can't show love in your own congregation. And, and you're going to go out and you're going to help the Pioneer School meeting, yes. which is outside of your congregation. What's the script, scriptural principle? If you can't handle your own family, how are you going to go and give to someone else's family? It, it, it's just. Anyway, but that type of incompetence, negligence, really. um is so bad i know that they won't be following through i mean in in, in our case they'd have to either call us i suppose you could have the telephone but i i just don't see it i, I don't, don't see, see that it. and we're we're far away like we're over an hour drive from the hall but i just want to make this point i want to say even if it's been a really long time for somebody who's been to fellowship i think they start thinking about things maybe i don't know what whatever your circumstance is but at the same time don't forget yeah don't forget what don't get overly sentimental don't forget how people treated you for the last however long or during that time period unless it was on your own terms and you left or you faded or you disassociated and you really did want to leave that's a different situation but if they're trying to draw you back and lead you to repentance or whatever they want to call it um don't let them manipulate you and to say, like, you were wrong or you're bad, don't forget how they treated you. Don't forget how that made you feel. And that, you know, again, that comes from our own perspective, because maybe you did do something wrong, you know. But, but no the doubt, shaming is ridiculous. Yeah, but, the, but no doubt, some of the th ways you were treated, you've seen some things, if you have, if you've seen some things that show what they really are, don't forget those because of sentimentality. But even if you did something wrong, yep. what I'm saying is they treat you inhumane. Yeah. Don't forget that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, again, will we go back? I'll never say no. I'll say how. See, right then she goes. Mm. Mm. I say, how will it be any different? I'll never say no. I'll say, how is it going to be different? If it's the same and it's the same answer and you've got the same attitude, it's going to end up the exact same way. There was a post that I have a friend that posted something on Facebook. Funny enough, it was this morning. And my comment to it was, the post was basically about uh, having a church building, you know, you don't have to go to a church building. You can have God like at 2 a.m. or a couple friends talking or you're in the shower, you know, brought out all these different scenarios. And my comment was, I don't know 
this is the way I phrase it. I don't know if I could ever step foot in another church building in my life. I guess I'm jaded. And then I said, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. So it sounds like no building required. That was my comment. And I, st I do believe that. I do believe that, you know, you want to say, how will it be any different? And for me, I'm, and I phrase it, I don't know. I don't know. But as my heart is right now, how it's, how it stands right now, I don't, I don't see myself walking into a building in the name of religion to listen to somebody manipulate and abuse their authority over me. And when they start off with things, and it's another thing that I've always found irritating, it's the same thing. We've been on eBay for 25 years, 25 years. I get on the phone and I'm educating eBay about their policies, the representatives about the policies a lot of times. I, I'm not saying that I know everything and they're always changing things. So I'm not saying that I'm not learning something along the way. But eBay itself is always saying, things they send you messages about learn how to net learn how to sell your item learn how to do this learn how to do that in other words you want me to keep up with all of your changes in policy and how you skim off the top you know all the different ways through promote it, a lot of people don't realize this about ebay and all the things for example and it's not just ebay it's all corporate i just happen to know ebay i could talk about some other things we're involved in too but uh as far as corporate actions banks and things of that nature but uh ebay is an easy one because they're so that way governments are the same way but all the different policies they have to where they can skim so it's like you've got your fees when you your store fees and then you've got your your fees when if you don't have a store fee, then you got fees when you're listing. And then you have your closing fees. And then you have to promote your item because they've broken the algorithm, the search algorithm, because you can't find what you need anymore. So in order to even find your item, you have to promote it. And, and if you don't pr promote it, then they'll just hide your item. I've literally go on there and I try to find something personally, looking for something to buy. And I type it in, can't find it. Search it, a word search, go to the advanced search change the put exact words change the because you can search how you're going to search can't find it for nothing go on google and just do a, a blanket search on google and i find it listed on ebay the same item so if they're hiding other people's items they're probably hiding mine too and they're hiding yours and so all the and then there's promoted listings advanced but if you just go along with whatever they tell you to do learn from us learn from us learn from us that means that they can manipulate you that means that you are the cult. You 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 you've bought into the cult, and and that makes you the cult, not them, because everybody does it. Governments do it, religions do it. You're the cult. You've bought into it, and it's the same thing here with Job's witnesses. They're saying, "Learn from us. Learn from the faithful slave. We're here to learn. You learn. You learn. Learn. Learn." In other words, it holds them up as the authority. They can never learn from you. They're never wrong. They never do. So it's it's that type of attitude that continues to permeate. And I think that's the problem when you start walking into any church. The minister is no longer serving. He's the priest. It's, it becomes this hierarchy thing. The pastor, I'm leading you. All of those types of ideas, though, go into elevating them above you. And it's the same thing with faithful slave. It's become a title. It's become a title. They no longer look at themselves as a good for nothing slave. Mm -hmm. They just don't look. They should be pleasure, privileged to have the ability to share something with someone else. But they don't have that attitude. They don't have that attitude. You need to come and repent to us in order to have God's blessing. Go ahead. I don't think every religion or church, obviously, it's not created equal. And some, you know, I don't know what their what everybody's mission statement is or what their motivation is. But like some some religious entities, religious, whatever they are, 
they want to focus on doctrine where others, they want to focus on almost like a motivational speaker mentality. And it's like people walk into those buildings for a feel good instead of it's like a therapy. I don't know. And I just don't, I don't need any of that in my life. I just don't want to, but I don't want a bunch of bullshit in my life. Well, and, but there's nothing wrong with a motivational speaker. The Bible is motivating. I mean, that's, uh, so I'm not opposed to that, but in the end, really it's tied to the coffer. The better you feel right. when you leave, you're going to leave more money in there. And that's scriptural. I mean, as far as why do you keep it's paying? Always why do you, why do you, then that's true. Why do you keep paying for what is not bread? Yeah. You know, that's when tithing was, was, was something. Now that's not, that's not a thing. Many religions still hold to that, but that's not a thing at all. So you could, should give out of the goodness of your heart, basically. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, but I'm just willingly, not under compulsion. You shouldn't be compelled to do it. Now Jehovah's Witnesses. They make you pledge. Pledge. Yeah, you you're pledged. You're no longer a, you're compelled. They hand out a thing for you to not just every month passing the plate. They just do it once a year and you pledge that amount. So they don't have to pass the plate because they already know how much you're gonna give. Because you've already pledged it. So it, it's it's compelled, it's under compulsion. So mm. uh, that type of thing, I I I I agree with you on that. I personally don't see me walking into a religious building either. I'm just saying, how would it be any different? Explain to me how it would be any different. I just get an icky feeling in dealing with a lot of that stuff. Maybe it's just because I see so much different kind of corruption and everybody's trying to manipulate somebody else. And I just don't want it in my life. I'd rather, I'd rather not put myself in that position yeah. yeah it's difficult and it's just my opinion i mean if you feel like you want to go inside of a building and you know get a little tidbit of something that they're giving you and you can walk away and feel great i i'm happy for you that you can do that but for me i don't i don't think so because <laughs> the only fluff i need I don't need that fluff. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, it's interesting. Comment below whether you think you're going to get a call. Yeah, if yeah. I mean, they don't even. Honestly. I know people that are just inactive, and they don't follow up on those people. They don't follow up on those people. You can't even follow up on the ones that are inactive. How are you going to follow wonder, up on disfellowshipping people except for to try to pad the numbers on Memorial? I really wonder how many people left during the pandemic. I wonder if there's a number to show. I mean. Hard to say. Yeah, I don't know how they'd come up with those. What kind of manipulation they do to come up with a number for that. Because then when they drop the time, you were just linked right back in as long as you were. Yeah, and, we're activating, you know, we're really activating. And, and in principle, a lot of the things that they were saying, I agree with, you know, um, it should be loving. You should want to to um, help people that are going through difficult times. As one elder said, and I think he was a good elder, he said uh, he got removed. <laughs> but uh, um, he said. Uh, the friends are not problems, they have problems. And that's just not the how they treat it by and large, you know. So, but this just seems like it's two things: a people, a numbers grab, which ends up being a money grab, and a government appeasement, you know. So a little halfway of that, but it's all this trivial. Trivial acquiescing, if you will, so they can keep perpetrating the same problems. Because guaranteed that again, the micromanaging is not going to stop. Well, and I have a, I have something to say about this too, because it's like, how is this fixing the bigger issues? Like we've talked about in the last few, it doesn't address anything important. It doesn't, but it's the same. Your pants to the hall. Go go get some people that you haven't seen in a while. You know, be nice to them to their face. Their fake love bomb. Do whatever you got to do. But it doesn't address the big picture of anything. And that's the exact same thing with politics, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. It's the exact Absolutely. same thing. It and it's another thing. We don't get involved in politics. 
we don't Granted, lean with much at all. <laughs> we 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 lean one way more than the other just because of you know biblical values. Um and one's I mean, but you can find biblical values in in any both. type of you but yeah. you can in any capitalism type of government. Let a man if he does not want to work, neither let him eat. You could you could use that scripture to support capitalism. You want to support the right side? That that's a, a verse you could use. You want to support the left side? Talk about giving. God loves a cheerful giver. Assist the weak. I mean, those are scriptural scripture principles too. So, but it's the one versus the other, uh, and a lot of the things, the policies they'll enact, or they're usually trivial. They don't address the big issues. They don't. They never. Uh, they never address the big issues. Just whatever is going to distract from the immediate small things so they can keep spinning whatever wheel they've got behind the scenes. And that's what this is. They just are changing these little tiny things that really are trivial in the long run. Trivial, as we mentioned before. Oh no, it's trivial. It's micromanaging. Yeah. It should have never been micromanaged in the first place. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll have to do a little edit on this and <laughs> so we were full of piss and vinegar. I told you that when we started, it was one of those days. He was um, more than I than me. Oh no. You had your moments too, love. It wasn't with each other. It was just things that were dealing going with on. people's others. People's and and buyers and the things. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll try to find something maybe depending on how long it is. I don't know. We'll post whatever we feel like. <laughs> Just like we usually do. Nasty muddy mess under there. <laughs> Got some, some mud droplets on your face there, Dolly. Out of my face. Want to do all parts? I'm going to get...